open your Bible to the book of Philippians and let's pray. Father, I thank you for this book. I thank you for this letter. What a great letter it is, Lord. Thank you so much for the things that you teach us about yourself. Thank you for the example that Jesus gave in his humility. Thank you, Lord, for the exhortations we have to walk in unity together and um, as we do so, walking in joy. So, Lord, help us um, dig into your word tonight and see what you would say to us at this time as just what you said to the church at Philippi. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, sometimes you just cannot help getting into an argument. For instance, while attending a marriage seminar on communication, David and his wife listened to the instructor declare, it's essential that husbands and wives know the things that are important to each other. And he addressed the man, can you describe your wife's favorite flower? David leaned over, touched his wife's arm gently and whispered, Pillsbury all-purpose, isn't it? (laughs) Not all arguments can be avoided, but all arguments can be addressed. Uh, The problem comes in when we don't want to address them, when we let things fester and disagreements, uh, you know, become divisions, and that sometimes leads to something worse. That's bad enough, obviously, just in people around us in the world, but it can cause havoc church. And that seems to have been the case with the church in Philippi. Now, there was a lot going on in Philippi over which Paul could rejoice, but there was also true division that was festering, and Paul's desire was for their reconciliation. And if they would just do what was necessary for unity, then they could once more walk in the joy of the Lord. Now, the author obviously is Paul. Um, You might notice in verse 1, Timothy is named there as well. The bulk of the letter is written in the first person singular, and he, you know, when he's, he does name Timothy in a third-person sort of format to the Philippian church. So it's likely he left Timothy's name there in verse 1 just to, you know, lend him, you know, Paul's own credibility. But the letter, of course, written to the church at Philippi, specifically as we see here to the saints, the deacons, and the bishops, which speaks to how well the church was organized at the time that Paul was writing the letter. You might recall the city of Philippi. Um, If you know anything about Roman history, it was the most important city in all Macedonia at the time. It was a Roman colony on the uh, Via Ignatius, the Ignatius Way, a very important trade route. And so it was very wealthy. It was a colony. So its status as a colony set it apart from other cities around the empire. One of the reasons, by the way, Paul could get such quick attention when he was treated unjustly there. We'll get to that in a moment. Paul visited Philippi during his second missionary journey. You've seen this map before. Philippi is way up there at the corner of Macedonia and Thrace. Uh, you can read all about it in Acts 16. You might recall he went there when, after he'd received a dream of a man from Macedonia asking him to come over here. By the way, some people theorize that that man in the dream was uh, Luke. There's no way of knowing, but some people theorize it. it Luke was probably from Philippi himself. But he was there for a few days. After a few days, he meets a woman by the name of Lydia, who was a merchant. She was a seller of purple. Her house became uh, the home base for Paul and Silas while they were there, at least up until the point that they were jailed. You know, one day they're walking along, they're ministering. There was a slave girl that was demon-possessed, following him around town, being an annoyance to him, a distraction from his ministry. Finally cast the demon out of the girl which was good for the girl, but it was bad for her slave owners because they profited off of, you know, her possession. And so they throw a fit. Paul and Silas are arrested. They're thrown into jail, and they sing, and they worship. And around midnight, God sends an earthquake, causes all the cells to fall open, frees all the prisoners. If it had not been for the integrity of Paul and all the others there, the jailer would have committed suicide, knowing that he had supposedly failed in his task. Well, the jailer ends up coming to faith. They care for Paul and Silas into the morning. And Paul and Silas finally leave town after they get a very public apology from the city officials for their unjust treatment because Paul was a Roman citizen. He was in a Roman colony. You just don't jail a person without a trial. And so they could have thrown a fit, and he at least got an apology out of them. All in all, they're not in Philippi very long. Uh, That's not what Acts 16 shows. It wasn't like in Ephesus where he was there for three years. Long enough, though, for a church to be established, Paul likely visited Philippi again uh, when he passed through Macedonia on his third missionary journey. He was there at least one more time prior to his fateful trip to Jerusalem, where, of course, he was arrested in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 20. Other letters indicate that he was, had some further visits there. The full number we don't know. Um, we 
Paul had regular communication with the churches in Macedonia. They gave regular financial support to Paul throughout his ministries. That's one of the things we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Part of the reason for this particular letter, in fact, was to thank the Philippians for one such gift. Now, as to when this letter was written, we plainly know that it was during one of Paul's imprisonments. He repeatedly mentions his chains, so we know that he was arrested during the time. The question is, which one? He was in jail a lot, right? Um, although there's a bit of recent debate, tradition, and most scholars believe that Paul wrote this during his first imprisonment in Rome while it's under house arrest. So you might recall that's where the book of Acts leaves off in there, Acts 28. So sometime after that point, Paul probably wrote this. He also wrote Colossians and Ephesians and Philemon there. Philippians was probably the fourth and final letter he wrote during that time, or at least the final letter that we have recorded for us in the scripture here. In the letter, Paul indicates that he's ready to die. He's got a lot of confidence that he's going to be released, and he was, if indeed this was that first Roman imprisonment. So that gives us a date around 61 to 62 AD. Now you might note, 62 AD, that's barely 30 years after Jesus' cross and resurrection. And as we're going to find in chapter 2, Paul is writing incredible theology regarding Jesus' deity, his incarnation, and his exaltation, even of the end times and how all things are going to bow to him. In fact, Paul's probably referencing a Christian hymn regarding those things in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. What that tells us is all this theological truth about Jesus' deity, that's not a later invention that arose out of legend. That's not anything like that. This was something believed by and testified to by the early church from the very beginning because that hymn had been along, uh, around long enough for Paul to learn it and pass it on to others. Okay, so although Paul was under house arrest in Rome, it doesn't mean things were easy for him. He still had basic needs, no way to support himself, so he needed financial gifts from the churches to you know, just stay alive, be as healthy as possible. The church of Philippi sent him a gift by the hand of a man called Epaphroditus, whom they hoped would stay with Paul, continually ministering to his needs while there. At some point, as we'll find out, Epaphroditus became dreadfully ill, and once he got well enough to travel, Paul sent him back to the Philippians. He didn't want the church to think that Epaphroditus had failed. He didn't. And so he wrote of his genuine thanks for the gift, but he's also writing of his approval of Epaphroditus and his hope that he would send Timothy off to the church as well. So he's rejoicing over the Philippians. They gave them this really great demonstration of practical love. But at the same time, he was truly concerned for them. Along with the gift came news of arguments and disunity among the church, came the news of potential threats from false teachers. The Judaizer just showed up. And so Paul's heart broke for them. And you really see in Philippians a, a heart of a pastor for his congregation here. And he implores them to seek humble uh, unity, to continually rejoice in the true gospel. And you know what? Unity has always been an issue for the church. We just saw this in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. Jesus' central prayer for us today as a church was for unity. And you can't go through the New Testament without reading of these various arguments and divisions that had developed uh, very, very early on. And of course, it's still an issue today. Christians, you know, we all too uh, readily maintain grudges against one another. We're, you know, trigger happy when, when it comes to becoming offended. We have a tendency of majoring on minor doctrinal issues, but, you know, we forget the really important ones that ought to concern us. And so what this means is that the letter to the Philippi, uh, it was just as relevant today as when it was first written. We are still called to humble ourselves following the example of our Lord Jesus, being unified together in the love of Christ. And when we are, that's something over which we can truly rejoice. Now, as far as an outline goes, the letter to Philippians, it doesn't outline as easily as uh, many of Paul's other letters do. Um, it's historically divided into four chapters, but remember that chapter and verse numbers are not divinely inspired. Uh, just FYI, uh, chapters didn't really come along until the 13th century. Verse numbers didn't come along until the 16th century. Uh, so, you know, it, relatively early, you know, development. Uh, Philippians is one of the books that seems to overlap those established divisions, so I think it's better to outline it somewhat topically, and we'll do that tonight. The first thing we see is Paul's circumstances in the first part of chapter 1, and this is when he has joy in his jail time. He's giving thanks for the Philippians. The second portion is, uh, crosses over from chapter 1 into chapter 2, and this is his appeal for humble unity. 
even more than the idea of joy. And everybody thinks of Philippians and they think of this letter of joy, and that's true. But even more than that is Paul's repeated appeal for unity seen and exampled by the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives a commendation for his friends. Again, he was sending uh, Epaphroditus back to them. He's also planning to send Timothy, and he gives a, a brief mention of each of them. And while he's talking about friends, he's also talking about the false teachers that had come and gives warnings against these Judaizers. He comes in with himself. Um, he gives them another appeal to persevere in unity uh, towards the end of chapter 3, beginning at chapter 4. Uh, the Philippians were to press on in the faith, just like Paul. They were to be one with Paul in doctrine and action. There is a brief series of general exhortations. Uh, they range from, you know, uh, unity again. Uh, to prayer, to meditation, and then finally uh, giving of thanks and close, encouraging them that God would continue to provide for them. So we're going to jump to things here with Paul's circumstances first with the greeting. It's a very standard greeting from Paul, although it's notable that he calls himself, and of course Timothy as well, he calls himself a bondservant, or really more properly a slave. He uses the word doulos here for slave. He doesn't call himself here an apostle, and that's a, a change that we've seen from some of other of Paul's letters. Paul does bring correction to the church here. He does bring warning to the church here. But the letter to Philippians is not overtly disciplinary, right? He's coming in love. He's coming in pleading. He's not coming in authority. Now, if it were needed, he would have done so. He didn't hesitate to do so with the letters to the Corinthians or Galatians. But here it wasn't necessary, Uh, otherwise, he blesses them with grace and peace according to his normal habit. By the way, it's always going to be in that order. That order is very biblical because, of course, the grace has to be experienced first before we can ever experience the peace of God, and that's why you always see that in that order. And then just very brief introduction there, and then he jumps right into giving thanks uh, to the Philippians. This is his primary reason for writing, of course. It's interesting, in this first section here, the financial gift is not mentioned. The financial gift isn't mentioned until later on in the letter. His main reason for giving thanks is the church itself. <laughs> Paul values people more than gifts, which is the way it ought to be. He rejoiced over the Philippians often in their prayers. He was thankful for the relationship that he had with the church. He was confident that God would continue to work within them. Of course, what Paul knew of the Philippians is also true with us. God always is working in the lives of those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Look, if you would, at verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will, be, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And this gives us such assurance, doesn't it? God is not done with us yet, and praise God for that. And we may fail, and we will fail. We do fail often, but God has not abandoned us. He works with us, and he will continue working with us. He will continue working in us, and the work that he started, he will finish. There's no doubt about it. So otherwise, Paul prayed for the church that they would continue to grow in love and knowledge and discernment. Basically, he prays that they would continue to mature in their faith. God would work with them, but that doesn't mean they had nothing to do, right? They needed to grow. They passively received the grace of Jesus. We all passively receive the grace of Jesus when we put our faith in him and his work at the cross and resurrection, but we actively live for him every day. We make the choice to walk in the power that God makes available to us. We make the choice to say no to sin and yes to holiness. Now, that's impossible to do without God first working within us, but the final choice to do so is ours. And so you've got this balance where God is working, but now we re work, we respond, we actively choose uh, to do that for him. Okay, so he's giving thanks, and then he's also talking about how he's preaching in prison in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Paul has much time to pray, because he's not going anywhere. He's in prison. Now, that being the case, he wanted the church to know he wasn't, you know, this wasn't wasted time and that sort of thing. He didn't want to be there, obviously. He would have rather been somewhere else, but God allowed him to use his time for the gospel. Even Caesar's own personal guard had heard the gospel from Paul. We see it in verse 13. His chains did not slow down his evangelism. His chains actually promoted it. After all, what else is Paul going to say to the soldiers to whom he's chained? Right? They were the captive audience, not Paul. Paul was willing to use every opportunity to boldly speak the word of God without fear, as he says in verse 14. And that provides a great example for the rest of us. What opportunities that you have, use those. Don't always be wishing for something different. 
Use what you've been given. Now, that's not to say everybody was happy with Paul's preaching. Some were envious of him for whatever reason. They tried to call attention to themselves by preaching the gospel. Were they doing it for the wrong motivation? Sure, yes. But the gospel was still preached, and Paul said in verse 18 that he could rejoice, and in that he would still greatly rejoice. I think there's a bit of parallel here to the charlatans who go out and preach in evangelistic services in a way to promote themselves and fill their own pocketbooks. Is what they do awful? Yes. But you know what? Sometimes people still get saved. And for that, we can praise the Lord, right? If God can speak through Balaam's donkey, he can speak through televangelists. He might even speak through you and me, right? God will judge those who do those things wrongly, but we can still rejoice over those who get saved. And so leave the, the judgment there for the Lord. Goes on in the latter part, part of the latter part of chapter 1, about living or dying for Jesus. In prison, of course, Paul is faced with a very real possibility of death. He thinks he's going to be released, but he's prepared to die. His prayer is that God uh, would continually magnify Christ within him, whether he lives or he dies, he says in verse 20. In fact, Paul wasn't quite sure which one was preferable. You look at verse 21. Very famously, he writes, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If he lived... He had work to do for the glory of Jesus, and he had the testimony of Jesus' deliverance from death. But if he died, he was in the presence of God. That's a win-win scenario. Right? All Christians have the same win-win scenario. This is one reason we don't face death the same way the rest of the world does. They don't have hope, but we do. Not only will we live and see our Lord Jesus, but be reunited with all of those that we love that also have faith in the Lord Jesus. That's wonderful. Doesn't mean we're not sad when somebody dies. Sure we are, but... You know, we also have hope for them if they're Christian and for us. For every Christian who dies, guess what? They're the ones who are actually the ones that are better off. Why? Because they're with Jesus. That's gain. All right, our next section, he uh, appeals to humble unity. First, he's showing that unity is worthy conduct at the very end of chapter 1. At this point, he's starting to hone in on the, the main theme of his letter, which again is unity. Um, mentioned before, the book of Philippians is known for its repeated mention of joy. It's one of the most repeated words in the book of Philippians, but the overarching appeal, every time you see uh, um, an imperative, the vast majority of them are for unity. Christians can rejoice why? when we are one. Paul rejoiced over the maturity of the Philippian church, but there was one area in which they struggled, and it was unity. And that's why he's appealing to them. Look at verse 27. To let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, which will be done through them, being, as it says, in one mind, uh, stringing together for the faith of the gospel. Their disharmony opened the door up to fear. That's something upon which their enemies would jump. But they believed in the one unified gospel that Paul preached to them, and now they were to stand fast in what it was Paul given them, surrounded by the gospel of Jesus Christ. How is that unity accomplished? It is accomplished through humility, as we see in verses 1 through 4, chapter 2. How much did Paul value their humility? How much did he value their unity, I should say? Look at the repeated ifs in verse 1 and 2, right? Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. In other words, if any of that stuff, all the very stuff you can think of that's valuable of being in Christ, if that actually exists in your life, now what? Follow through. Don't get caught up in strife. Don't get caught up in selfishness. Be humble. It's when we're humble, that's the point we can come into unity with one another. Why? Because at that point, we're getting ourselves out of the way. We start looking to the needs of other people. Right? That's part of the second greatest commandment, to love our neighbor as ourselves. When we stop promoting ourselves, we start looking to the needs of the church body. We start seeking what's best for all of us as believers in Jesus Christ. That brings us into the will of God. And God himself exampled this for us in Christ. And here's where we get that hymn in verses 5 through 11. Now, Paul is going to point to himself as an example for the Christians to follow, but he's ultimately pointing to Jesus. There's no one in history that demonstrates humility better than the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul explains it here, and I think it's better just to read it in his own words, starting in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it free to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What Paul writes is so poetic, it's so sublime, that many scholars believe this was not Paul's original writing at all. And it does sound different than his usual style of writing, flowing even more like poetry than what he normally would do. And that's why some of the scholars believe that this is an ancient Christian hymn that Paul incorporated into the letter. This is something that he himself was perhaps taught and then taught to others, quotes it here. However it originated, it's beautiful. It's got the stamp of the Holy Spirit just because it's included in the book of Philippians. Paul chose to include it here, so it's got the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the overall point is that Jesus truly humbled himself, and thus we should do likewise. Jesus came from infinite glory to the dust of mankind, and there's no greater humiliation than that as far as you can go. But in addition, Jesus also returned to heavenly glory and will be one day recognized as God by all of creation. And that glory of Jesus is the very glory into which we ourselves will be brought when we see him face to face. We will share in that glory as we share in his inheritance. It just shows once more that the grace and the promises that we have in Jesus are astounding. So, humility, of course, is exampled in Christ. Humility shows the work of God. In verses 12 through 18, he again exhorts the Philippians to walk worthy of the gospel, this time phrasing it in terms of working out, it says in verse 12, working out their own salvation. This itself is the evidence of the work of God among them, as we see in verse 13. How does he describe it all? Well, in terms of humility and unity. Verse 14, they're to do all things without grumbling or disputing or complaining. Verse 15, they're to be blameless. Verse 16, they're to hold fast to the gospel that Paul had given them. That's how they would share in his ministry, and that's why they could rejoice. Okay, his next section, again, he starts commending some of his friends that he's sending to them. And the first person he mentions is Timothy. Recall that Timothy was listed as a co-author of the letter. And we get the reason why here. Because Paul was sending Timothy to Philippi in order that Timothy might minister to Philippi on Paul's behalf. Remember, Timothy was young. But Paul didn't want people to think that he was unworthy of his charge. This was a man completely like-minded to Paul, he says in verse 20. Verse 22, he says he thinks of him as his own son. And so they're to receive Timothy just like they would receive Paul himself. And Paul had hoped to join Timothy there eventually. The other commendation mentioned is a native of Philippi, and that's Epaphroditus. And recall that the church had sent him to Paul as their own emissary. They were hoping that he might be able to minister to Paul in some way, serve him, uh, for Epaphroditus to return from Rome Walking up to Philippi, that's likely would have been seen as a major disappointment. They would be wondering, had Epaphroditus been unpleasing? Had he been unworthy in some way? Well, not at all. Paul wrote to quell their fears, you know, calm down the rumors. Epaphroditus had gotten sick. He had nearly died while ministering to Paul, as he says in verse 27. And of course, we remember what he wrote in chapter 1, that to die and be with Christ is better but he still didn't want somebody, you know, dropping dead on his doorstep, (laughs) right? Death is not actively sought out here, and so he makes sure to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi as soon as the opportunity arose. And yet, with Timothy, you know, receive him joyfully. Epaphroditus had been a faithful servant, willing to even lay down his life for the ministry of the gospel. Now, before we move on, just by way of observation, praise God for the inclusion of both of these men in this letter. You know, there, we recognize Timothy, and you might recognize Epaphroditus from other places, but some of these people that are mentioned, we know from history, there are many, many more that we don't. You know, they did not have a platform as large as Paul's, but just because somebody doesn't have a huge ministry platform doesn't mean that their service is not valuable to the Lord. We all have a part to play in the body of Christ. We all have things that the Lord has specifically commissioned us to do. We may not be well known, but we're known by the Lord. He knows your name, even if nobody else does. Just like, of course, Timothy and Epaphroditus here. We have a little bit of a contrast with these friends with false teachers. You know, there were certain people that Paul wanted to commend to the Philippines, uh, Philippians, but there were others that he condemned. He learned of false teachers among the church, uh, most likely these same Judaizers who had followed Paul from city to 
to city on his missionary journeys. And so he addresses them in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. These were men, the Judaizers were, who took great confidence in their own Jewishness. They were trying to make people into good Jews before being good Christians. Basically, they were preaching a works-based salvation founded on really a perversion, but founded on the law of Moses and the custom of the rabbis. And Paul does not mince words at all when describing them. He calls them dogs, evil workers, the mutilation, verse 2. And mutilation is referring to a mangled circumcision. So, I mean, really bad stuff here. You know, that's that, people. The true circumcision, the true chosen people of God, he says, are those who rejoice in Christ Jesus, who worship God in spirit and truth. They're not relying on the works of the flesh, verse 3. Now that said, you know, if somebody wanted to take Paul to the mat, they want to get a battle of the Jewish bands with Paul, he's happy to oblige, right? He's got more Hebrew qualifications than any of the Judaizers who plagued the Philippians. And he goes and he lists it off here. His pedigree, his credentials are flawless. If anyone had the right to teach the law of Moses to Christians, it was the Pharisee Saul of Tarsus, but he didn't. What did he do? Well, as he says in verses 7 through 11, he cast all those credentials away. He treated them as rubbish. And literally that word is dung, and I'm using the nice version of the word here. Dung, rubbish. Why? Well, because he had something that was far better than his pedigree and his degrees. He had Jesus. The righteousness that he received from Jesus far outweighs any other righteousness that Paul could have achieved on his own. The righteousness he received by faith is the true righteousness of God, verse 9. And once he received that, now he could truly know Christ and the power that comes through Jesus' resurrection. That same power that sustained Paul through all his own sufferings and even, you know, unto his own future resurrection from the dead, which, of course, we will all be raised from the dead. The bottom line, of course, that Paul is getting across is that works don't work. No matter how much we do as humans, we cannot do anything that earns our place in heaven. The only way we will experience eternal life with God is if we receive the righteousness of God, and that's something that cannot be earned. It must be given. So no matter how much we pray, how much we weep, how much we plead, how many rituals we go through, what ashes we put on our head at certain times of year, whatever, nothing else will get us life that's only received by faith through Jesus Christ. As another appeal to persevere in unity, first he talks about pressing toward the goal. Of course, Paul wasn't in heaven yet. Even the apostle Paul knew he had a ways to go. He still had work ahead of him, not to earn life, but to live life for Jesus. And so he pressed on. You know, as a marathoner, I, I think you, you press on when it gets to that point two of the 26.2 miles, you still have that point two to go. <laughs> and that's a long point two. <laughs> Paul pressed on to the very end, right? He says in verse 14, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As long as we draw breath, we're not done. You know, we might retire from our occupation, but we never retire from our faith. There's always more to do for the Lord Jesus. There's always more we can learn of him. There's always more we can pray. There's always more that, you know, they need to hear the gospel. There's always more that, you know, need to see the, the love of Jesus. And again, none of those things save us. They don't make us more righteous, but they are definitive outworking of our faith once we are saved. And so we don't give up. We press on, we persevere. And as we press on, we follow good examples. Uh, Paul exhorted the Philippians to follow him, verse 17. He wasn't the only one. There was Timothy. There were others. Whoever it is that follows after Jesus in spirit and truth, walk with them. Now, not everybody does. He says in verse 18, some are enemies of the cross of Christ. They don't follow Jesus. They follow, as it says in verse 19, the God of their own belly. They follow their own lusts. Now, that's not us. That's not to be the, the Philippians. They were to remember that it was in heaven. They may have lived in a prominent, wealthy Roman colony, but their ultimate allegiance was not to Rome. It was to Jesus, who would one day do all things to him. By the way, we are currently, of course, in an election year, so it's natural of us, for us to think often of our nation and the direction that our country is going, but we should not lose perspective. Our earthly home is not our permanent one. Praise God for that. Our true citizenship is not a democratic republic. It is a theocratic kingdom, the kingdom of God. We serve King Jesus, and our home is where he is. So we need to make the choice to live right now as if we're already living in the kingdom. Because guess what? In a real way, we are, right? 
He gives some general exhortation. He wants to reconcile some friends. He's already written a lot about unity among the church, but it's possible that some of those thoughts that he had for the whole church were spurred on by news of arguments between two dear female friends in Philippi. Uodio, excuse me, Uodia and Syntyche had both ministered with him in the gospel, and they were apparently at odds against one another. Now, Paul knew what it was like to have sharp disagreements with a partner in ministry, right? He had that with Barnabas. They split ways. And so his for these two women is that they would be reconciled together. Interestingly enough, their names, Uodia means prosperous journey. Syntyche means pleasant acquaintance. So neither one of them were living up to their names. They're not living up to their identity in Christ. Obviously, we will have disagreements from time to time. That's natural, but don't let that be the end of it. Resolve those disagreements and live at peace with one another. That's what he's exhorting these two women to do. Uh, next, he gives a few quick exhortations to be joyful, to be gentle, to be prayerful. He's rejoicing in his own sufferings. Now he calls the church to rejoice in the Lord at all times. And there's so many things here that are all. Not all things are joyful, but all times can be joyful when our joy is in the Lord. Similarly, all men are to witness the gentleness of all believers. I'm short. The Lord's returning soon. We're still living in the last days after all. So how do we want to be known when the Lord returns? Well, we want to be known as unified, joyful, gentle Christians, witnessing to the world. We could be known as argumentative, backbiting, selfish people, looking only to ourselves and no one else. Obviously, the you know, answer should be clear which one we should desire more. There's one more all here in regards to prayer. Pray for all things, being anxious over no things, so that we know the peace of God that passes all understanding. Prayer is so important for the believer in Jesus. Prayer does not only help us understand, prayer helps us experience the peace of God. If we're stressed, pray. If we're anxious, pray. How much trouble could we save our spirits if we just took time to pray? Isn't the promise so plain? It's in black and white here. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's as clear as a promise as we're going to find in the Scripture. It's not the peace of God might come to you. You can hope the peace of God possibly will come to you. No, you will have the peace of God guard your hearts and minds pray we spend so much time getting stressed out and worrying which manifests itself in all sorts of just terrible ways don't be anxious for anything pray in everything uh, one final exhortation he has uh, which by the way is actually the second finally of philippians he says finally here in verse eight of chapter four but he also said finally in chapter three verse one that's just how good of a preacher he is he had two closes and so he encourages the church here finally uh, to be mindful of what's on their mind. What they think upon goes a long way to determining whether or not they are anxious in the first place. What they meditate on determines much of what they do. It determines much of how they act. Right? So what do we think upon? Good things, godly things. Paul gives a, a whole list here. Which obviously isn't exhaustive. He's just going through synonyms here. He's running through all kinds of things that we're encouraged to think on. If it's good, if it's holy, if it's godly, meditate on those things. Don't fill your mind with the things of the world. Don't flood your heart with the stuff that's angry, well, that's sinful, that's lust-filled. You know, the old phrase in computer technology, when it first was coming out, remember this, garbage in, garbage out. Right? If you put the garbage in, that's all that's going to come out of your life. I don't understand why you know, I'm attracted to all this stuff over here. Well, maybe it's because we've been looking at this other stuff on the computer all day. Or, you know, listen to this stuff on the radio, and then my mouth starts spewing out this garbage. Well, there's a reason for that. Instead of that, meditate on stuff that's good. Meditate on the Scripture and see what comes out of your mouth at that point. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if we fill our heart with the things that are good, be amazed what comes out of our mouth as well. That stuff will glorify God. Uh, finally, he moves into this part where he's giving thanks and close. He gives, uh, mentions his contentment in chapter 4, 10 through 13. He finally, at this point, addresses the financial gift that the Philippians had sent him. He's so grateful that it arrived. He had taken pains to clarify that God had always provided for him, would always provide for them. 
Uh, you know, Paul was never seeking a gift to enrich himself. That wasn't the point. Um, he wasn't ever living high on the hog or anything like that. He, he knew that in whatever things that he suffered, Jesus would continue to give him the strength that was required. By the way, that's the whole point of chapter 4, verse 13. I've got to mention this very briefly. It's, a, it's a, just a point of irritation. I see this quoted out of context so many times when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not talking about doing a football game. It's not talking about, you know, I can just make it through this test or whatever. No, it's talking about he's suffering. He's hungry. He doesn't know how he's going to eat or sleep or whatever, make it through the night. But I can even make it through that time of suffering because Jesus is strengthening me. We understand the difference there. We don't want to cheapen this to be something else. Okay. I'll put that all aside. But even so, he was grateful for what uh, God had done through the Philippians for him. And so he writes of how they were abounding through the gift. No church had been so faithful to help Paul as had been the church at Philippi. When they provided for him in his time of need, they were sharing in his distresses. They were, though, also sharing in his ministry. That's the point of verse 14 here. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. You ministered to me in this way. You provided for this. You know, this is true regarding any missionaries that we might support. It takes the entire body of Christ to get the gospel on the mission field. See, people are not only needed to go to the mission field, uh, but others are needed to help send them to the mission field, right? And so all are included in that same ministry. They all share and partake of the fruit. So you can rejoice with your missionaries that you support for the work that's been done. Why? Because that was a ministry in which God used you as well. So in any case, Paul is grateful for how God had used the Philippians in the ministry. He's confident that God would bless him immensely for it. He says, you know, fruit had abounded in their account, verse 17. And God would supply all of their own physical needs as well, verse 19. And so he gives some final greetings here. I don't know why that jumps. He gives some final greetings here. They're fairly short. Paul had listed some specific names earlier, so we don't get a repetition here. General greetings go back and forth. It is notable that we have some of Caesar's household who had come to faith. There's just proof in the pudding here that God wasn't done working through Paul yet. Paul is not about to give up. People are still coming to faith right where he is. So joyful unity. This is what Paul called the Philippians to. This is our calling as well. Life, of course, is too short to spend it at odds with one another. As believers, we've got work to do. We've got a great commission that needs to be fulfilled so humble yourselves and be about doing it. Put petty differences aside. Work alongside one another with joy. Cast your cares upon the Lord Jesus, trusting his guidance and his provision the entire way. Now, maybe there is some relationship in your life that needs reconciliation. Go and get reconciled. If you're the one that's caused offense, you know, make it right. Maybe there's selfishness in your life that needs to be cast aside. Well, you know, look again to the example of Jesus and do it. Don't let anything get in the way of walking in the joy of Jesus. It can be so easily resolved if we just decide to do so. And of course, I always have to ask, if you don't even know the joy of the Lord Jesus, if you don't know what it means to be found in Christ, if you don't know what it means to share in these promises that he has, today you can. If you just surrender your life to Christ, ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And you can do that right now as we pray. Father, I thank you so much for this Short letter to the church at Philippi. I thank you, Lord, for the work that you were doing in that church. It was a marvelous work. And just as Paul rejoiced for them, Lord, we do as well. Uh, Lord, they uh, were used by you to support Paul in his ministry. And uh, there, who knows if we would even have some of these letters if it wasn't for churches like this supporting him along the way. So we thank you so much for them. Uh, Lord, we also thank you for what you told them through Paul and that we would hear the same Thing is, Lord, you had Jesus in each of his letters to the churches in Revelation. Let the, those who have the Spirit in the ear hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. And Lord, let us who have an ear need to hear the things you would say for us. Lord, where there's disunity, let there be reconciliation. Where there's selfishness, let there be humility. And where there's anxiousness, Lord, let there be joy. Help us cast these things upon you. Seek your face at all times in all things. Uh, so, Lord, you would receive the glory among us, and the gospel would continue to go forth uh, to this area this time. Lord, we thank you so much. I do pray for uh, any who might need to respond to the things that you're telling them tonight. Help them have the joy to f and the, uh, the courage, the faith to follow through. And, Lord, we thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.